When we're young, we move with freedom and confidence, with a great resilience to injury. But somewhere along the line, we develop poor habits and become more vulnerable to back pain. Back Pain Solutions features evidence-based and practical advice to help you take back control of your health and get back to the activities you love. This is your guide to better back health through movement. So join us as we demystify some of the commonly held beliefs about back pain and build your confidence to a stronger back the smart way. Welcome back to the Back Pain Solutions podcast, everybody. And in today's episode, Jacob is joined by a special guest. Simon Billings joins Jacob on the show to discuss all things nutrition. Simon graduated from the AECC back in 2001 and is today a doctor of chiropractic at St. James's Chiropractic Clinic in Southampton, down in the south of England. He's lectured nationally and internationally on the subjects of jaw joint disorders, nutrition and trigenics, and he's also published articles on the subjects of migraine, vitamin D deficiency, misshapen head syndrome, and ankylosing spondylitis, to name a few. Simon also teaches through the Academy of Chiropractic Nutrition an organization which he created with the goal to help chiropractors be more efficient with treating their patients through nutrition and supplementation. He speaks of the metabolic side of health as being overlooked by many chiropractors and no doubt many other healthcare professionals. So sit back and enjoy the show. Simon, welcome on the on the podcast and uh, uh, it's great having you here. So um, you're a chiropractor in uh, Southampton, England not mm-hmm. far from where I studied and uh, Ben, we studied together. Uh, where did you do your uh, your chiropractic teaching or your education? Yeah, same class in Bournemouth, same as you. I live in Bournemouth, work in Southampton. Uh, so I've qualified in 2001 and then I've been in private practice ever since. And I do three days as a chiropractor. And then I do uh, two days sort of uh, teaching a little bit, uh, nutrition, but also then doing one-to-one and uh, nutritional consulting uh, over Zoom uh, for uh, various sort of, you know, uh, various issues of my own health that sort of led me into the nutritional side of things. Yeah, that's that's what I wanted to ask you about because I, you know, I've been following your newsletters uh, and um, you speak of your own experience with autoimmune problems. And mm-hmm. I, I would have liked, actually, I would really like to know how you got into the whole nutritional uh, approach. Yeah. Can you can you tell us well, more? Well, I was always... I always had- I had more an interest in nutrition in college. I had, I remember having um, uh, you know, a Patrick Holford's nutrition book, and I was down at the local uh, health food shop buying things and trying to stop stuff, eating colds and things, and and so on, and taking supplements. Um, so I always had had an interest, but it was you know um, didn't really go much beyond that. And then I you know qualified, and during my um, so from my sort of late teens into the college years, sort of nineteen twenty up to the when I qualified twenty three twenty four. I got a lot of aches and pains all over my body and I kind of get, I get tendonitis in my shoulder and then tennis elbow on the other side, then the thumb tendonitis and then my ankle, then my back would hurt. And then it was move around a lot. And, um, and then I also got various things like I've had, so my skin would start peeling in places for no reason. I'd get acne again and then I have insomnia and uh, terrible concentration in lectures and so on. Yeah. And so, these were, I didn't realize at the time, these were all just warning signs that my health was failing slowly. And then by the time then I hit, I think sort of mid, no, probably late-ish 20s, by that point then I had some x-rays taken. I was just really uh, looking at my hips actually to see if they were a normal shape. And it, I could see then on the x-ray that one one of my pelvic joints had, uh, had damage uh, on the x-ray. And so, and I have a family history of uh, an arthritic condition called ankylosing spondylitis. Okay. My brother has that. Um, so then I, you know, I knew what it was. And I knew I, the, he'd taken a very traditional medical uh, route with the uh, medications and this, that, and the other. But, it, you know, it hadn't probably left him in, in, in a great place. And um, so I didn't want that for me. And I'd seen lots of patients, obviously, had come in with uh, ankylosing spondylitis. I knew, I knew what it could do to you for sure. So I was pretty motivated. Um, so I, um, uh, by that point I'd read a little bit more nutrition and I, I dug into the research and read some books and read lots of stuff online. And I found an association between, uh, your gut microbiome that certain bacteria in the gut, one called Klebsiella, which is a particular bacteria. Okay. And on the surface of this bug, it has a, a sequence of, um, molecules that look very, very, very similar to the collagen in your joints. 
Okay. So if your immune system takes aim at the bacteria, it recognizes it's overgrown, it shouldn't be in there in your, in your gut, it will take aim, but your collagen gets its mistaken identity. Uh -huh. So it attacks me okay. in, by mistake. And, and, and that was very well established in the research. It's nothing kind of woo woo. Right. It was really well established, um, but not part of mainstream uh, treatment. Per se. Yeah, because I, I mean, I myself haven't actually heard of it in such detail as you just explained it now. And and were you were you are you specifically speaking of the SI joints or more low back or hip joints? Uh, so well, it, well, AS will attack the whole spine pretty much, as you know, mm -hmm. and other things. But the um, so for that, yes, it's it's particularly SI joints because your the theory is that your gut where it drains the lymphatics, where the immune system lives, they, they drain down into the pelvis. Okay. And so the first part, the immune system goes, tends to be the sacroiliac joints in your pelvis. And then it will then, you know, eventually it will attack everything on and off. And you frequently see patients with AS. And it's the same with rheumatoid. They have other bugs they're associated with, just different, different bacteria that, again, look a bit like you. Um, yeah. But they go through flares. So same with most autoimmunities and things like MS, you'll get a real flare where they're in a lot of pain and then they will sort of drop again. They'll go through this acquiescent phase and then up again. And there's a sort of theory that maybe this is part of um, the life cycle of the bacteria. They're kind of building and building. And when they die, they release lots of poisonous chemicals as well. And you can get these big spikes of inflammation um, that autoimmune disease patients often go through. Yeah. So um, that was my first bit. And I kind of went through a process with that and a lot of testing. Um, I actually spoke to the lead researcher who had done all this researching in the 80s and 90s um, uh, about it. And then... Is, is that a British English blog? Yeah. Yes. Got Alan Ebringer in London. So he had a he had a London AS clinic yeah. that was very effective. They had um, the treatment, I should say, this is maybe it, our, uh, our application of this has evolved a great deal because this was in 2000, uh, where are we, seven or eight, maybe? Yeah. Um, they just did a zero starch or at least a very low starch diet. Okay. With the idea to try and damp, stop feeding the bugs. Yes, 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 makes sense. Now, there are pros and cons to that, but um, uh, when we'd have a, a more nuanced approach now, but uh, at the time he had a clinic in London, the AS clinic, or at least okay. in the 80s and 90s, and he had hundreds, thousands of patients in remission uh, from ankylosing spondylitis with no drugs or at least some of them far less drugs yes um but uh he got shut down actually his funding was oh, cut i should wow. say his funding was cut okay so um yeah so <laughs> uh, for various reasons i'm sure yeah. basically potentially but um so uh that was you know that was one part of it and there's there's other things that came along after that I, di I didn't know about as well well please tell us so i so i i i did that for a while and um was successful successful to a point and then I then had uh, my wisdom teeth removed on one side, yeah. and within I'd say within two weeks I had psoriasis. Okay, so that was pretty upsetting in the sense that um, when I had this inflammatory stuff in my back, it was my uh, my little secret, like no one else knew about it, and I could hide it and whatnot. Yeah. And I was trying, to, I was doing things to improve it, but the psoriasis it's 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 a very different thing, and that didn't really hurt me, but it was very um, visible. And on my hands as well as on my legs and body, and so uh, the the psychological effect was actually far worse in some ways because I, I felt very ashamed about that and kind of embarrassed at my appearance. So mm. at that point, I went back to the research and I actually saw um I saw a dermatologist and she said, "Well, it's psoriasis, and you take um, steroid cream. If that doesn't work, you do cold tar. If that doesn't work, you know you got this like a hierarchy of how hardcore the drugs get yeah. to bring it down." And um, I just left really upset. Um, I just knew there must be more to it than that. Yes. Couldn't like because I knew about the the other stuff, and I thought maybe this I, I hadn't fully gotten hold of what was going on, yeah. and I hadn't. So then I, I dug back into the research and happened to have some books um, around certain areas from the AS stuff, and I dug into that, found some research, and I found a group of researchers in uh, it was in tennessee in america yeah. and they had a 50 percent, more than 50 percent, i think complete remission from psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis as well okay. and they had a protocol they would a protocol of testing for infections again bacterial infections often streptococcus yeah. and then also yeast infections and they had a very a, quite a basic approach of just very hardcore antibiotics and uh, antifungal medicine but over 50 percent remission 
of um, you know a disease that if you if you look it up online or see a doctor, they'll that's you know, they'll say well you, you can't get rid of it. That's what it it's is. In, it's incurable, exactly. Like incurable. A lot and of these, so that's yeah. where I. I feel kind of I don't, again. I feel I, I felt really annoyed when I left, and even now I still get upset about it because I think there is. Then again, this isn't woo woo. They've yeah. known about infections and psoriasis for I think almost a hundred years. They had people have sore throats a lot. They'll often get psoriasis afterwards, and they would take people's tonsils out, and their psoriasis would go away. Yeah. And so here's a group of researchers since the 80s and 90s publishing data saying if you do this, you can get remission. And yet it was not, certainly not in the UK at least. Yeah. Um, it was nowhere near any of the, you know, and I paid privately to see this this uh, this consultant and, and somebody in London as well. So that I feel, I feel, <laughs> I feel somewhat frustrated and aggrieved for patients that, um, you know, we live in a, um, uh, certainly, you know, evidence-based medicine is meant to be a patient-centered experience. Yes, yes, yes. And you take the very best evidence yeah. and you take clinical experience and the patient's wishes and wants. Yeah. And I feel that it's not really done half the time. It's it's a nice sales pitch, but doesn't really deliver. I, I would, Very interesting what you're saying. And I think you've got a very good reason there, at least motivation, to do what you do because of your own experience. Mm-hmm. I have something mm-hmm. similar with my own low back, uh, a very heavy hernia I had uh, 10 years ago in the beginning of my career. And, uh, you know, that's pushed me along the path of really exploring how to get people better when they've had a low back hernia. Because I mm-hmm. I see so many people who, you know, they're, they're, the next step is getting a, an operation. Mm. Um, or they've had it for a year and a half or two years or longer, and it just doesn't go away. Mm. And, you know, the, the, the not only the frustration, but the hopelessness what, that you see sometimes in patients when they, uh, you know, they, they, they're past the point of frustration. There's just no more hope. It's, you know, they, they're mm. there and they tell you, look, I've been everywhere. And if you, you're my last hope, basically. I mean, I'm sure you've heard mm-hmm. that a few times. And, yeah. uh it's it's very frustrating for us and for me when you see that and 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 quite often you'd get somebody better in a few weeks, but it's been a mm. been a chronic problem for a couple of years or more, mm. and they've just not had the right diagnosis, they've not had the right mm. guidance, um, and I could just think of of so many of those examples. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's a nice story, nice hearing about your own experience. Mm. I think one other thing is. All of that, you know, I know that not every doctor or every chiropractor or osteopath or whatever is an expert in every area. Um, you can't be all things to all people, right? But some, it also, as a professional, you need to be able to recognize, well, this thing could be caused by this, this, and this. And I do all with these bits. I'm not really an expert on this. So when I spot it, I'll give you all the options of treatment. And if you want my bit, that's great. But if you want these bits, then you, you go and see someone else and I can give you a recommendation. Yes. They're not just doing your bit and not even mentioning the, the other stuff, I think is unethical. Which is what they get um, in the mainstream media. I, I would say, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's, it's, it's exactly that. You know, I'm, I'm a very functional chiropractor, which means that I, when I get somebody with who's had a, a hard hit against the head, and they need to see a neuro- neurological chiropractor. You know, I I, I have mm. my contacts. I send them on, and I don't. I, I already at the mm. at the intake at the first appointment. I I explain to them, well, it's great that you're here, but I'd really, you know, and there's no charge for today. But I, I'd really like you to go there, mm. just because mm. I know that they've got a much better chance of it uh, getting better. Yeah. So um, yeah, it, that's the reason why we really wanted to have you on the show because of you know your approach and you know i I really like your website where you you explain how some patients just won't get better with traditional chiropractic Mm. and um my thing has always been nutrition and Mm -hmm. i i'm still waiting for the day where i can really go into uh further study and, and really uh maybe get to a level where where you are at this present moment. I don't know if I'll ever reach that point because uh, I'm I'm also very caught up in other things. I think you know how it works. You only have that much time. But it's, it's great to see that there's this development of or at least awareness of nutrition and, well, maybe in sort of orthomolecular uh, nutrition supplement base 
mm. on top of the traditional chiropractic that we do because it is it's mm. an incredible powerful powerful and uh, yes so i yeah and i think you should remember that the um we are as we are iller uh, as people in west in the west now than we've ever been um because of our lifestyle we know we have a we have our our genetics and our evolutionary ancestry as, as hunter gatherers yeah. and we have a very modern lifestyle and and they don't fit very well and that's you know from a point of view how much we move like people just do a lot of sitting right i mean yes. we don't any anyway it's just constant sitting so that doesn't gel with who we are who we evolved as and the diet that we eat now is very different to anything we evolved uh, to eat and uh, the levels of pollution that we have uh in uh, in society uh the stress levels we have all these things are, are just bad and we live a long time because we have some good medicines to keep us going but the last sort of 10 years of life often is pretty poor quality yeah and so uh, i think like you know from our point of view when we were training uh you, you heard of these amazing stories about sort of holding one like uh, one treatment and the, you cure this patient of whatever it was right yeah, that doesn't really happen anymore. Not not like it did. I don't think. And I think part of the reason is people are very they have very low levels of nutrients in their diet, but high levels of toxins coming in. Yeah. And so they're very inflamed, generally speaking, uh, and very stressed. And this is a, you know, a, a good platform for people to get injured, and then stay injured, like you say, and not respond in the way that we know they could do. Uh, with the right sort of in, internal environment for themselves. Yes, but very deficient and at the same time, to a degree, toxic. And uh, yes. if you look at the videos of chiropractors uh, 100 years ago, I mean, I've, I'm sure you've watched those videos maybe as a student, and you see how they did the the upper cervical adjustments, and 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 they just looked. It looked like somebody's getting killed because. <laughs> I had this discussion with a uh, with another chiropractor. You know, I, like you say, people could just have a lot more back then. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm South African. I grew up in South Africa. And I know from a different lifestyle, uh, people are just a lot stronger than uh, where you would be maybe in Europe or when I moved to England. I, mm -hmm. I could see that just being so much inside, you know, different weather, but also a different mm -hmm. different culture where there's uh, you don't have to do as much as many physical things like you would in Africa, for example. Mm. It's 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 a little bit advanced in that way, but at the same time, it has its cost, and so people mm. people become weak. And you know, and I think if you would treat patients the same way as they did chiropractors did a hundred years ago, you would have a you would have a lot of problems, <laughs> <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of unwanted uh, problems. So. Um, but I think, you know, we have to say that as chiropractors, we, we really take care of the way we work, especially when it comes to manipulation. And, yeah. and that's obviously varied for the, the intensity is varied to the, the person we have. We're going to treat a very um, uh, a strong young male, very different to an, an elderly, frail lady. Mm. But um, I, I'm very curious about your view on vitamin D and how you work with it, what you, what you do with it. Um, if you don't mind. Yeah. So no, we, that's probably the most common thing we, we, we give out. And, um, again, we, we, we just look, look through the lens of evolution and you made a good point about, and, you know, if you live in South Africa, then, you know, from, um, from a genetic point of view, you're going to, your skin tone, your melanin content is adapted to the environment and that amount of sunshine. The problem is that if you are if you are ancestry from somewhere in Africa and you move north, then there's a mismatch between your you know your evolutionary ancestry and where you live, your latitude that you live now. So vitamin so those people we know in England, people of a, a black or Asian background are universally deficient, certainly in the winter and very commonly low even in the summer. And even amongst people that are Caucasian, we know that also they're in the middle of winter, about 90% of the population are either deficient or insufficient. Um, and that's because of a combination of in the summer when we should be getting sunshine, we spend a lot of time indoors. And then we are outdoors. Um, if we get out and you have to be out between about 11 and three or four o'clock in the afternoon for the sun to be strong enough to make vitamin D. So you can't make any vitamin D in England at least 
from about uh, September, October to around about April, you, you make none on your own at all, no matter how much sun, because the sun is too weak. So a good rule of thumb for people listening is that if your shadow is shorter than you are, yeah. then you will make vitamin D. If it's longer than you are, the sun is too weak to make any. So shorter than you are, good explanation. then you're okay. That's yeah, and that's generally between about 11 and 3-ish, 4-ish uh, in the UK, between about April and uh, September-ish. But you can't wear lotion if you yeah. want to make vitamin D because the whole point of the lotion is to block the UVB, and it's the UVB that will generate vitamin D. So we mustn't get burnt either. This is very important because that's uh, getting burnt is one of the best ways you can give yourself a melanoma later on in life. So the key thing would be, to you get it depends on your skin tone so i'm fairly fair sort of freddy freckly i don't need a lot of uh, sun time so i'm if i used to spend more than sort of half an hour 45 minutes i will burn so you want to aim for about a quarter to a third no more than a half of the time that you would take to get pink <laughs> so you're not going to get pink. you don't want that you want to spend maybe a third of that and then so if i guess i get burned in half an hour for example I would aim to get 10 minutes yeah. in strong sun with no lotion, um, with a good amount of skin out. You need at least, the very least, your arms and legs out, and ideally torso if you can get it. Um, and then once you've been to 10, 15 minutes or whatever it is, then you lotion up or you cover up or you sit in the shade. What you don't want to do, what I used to do when I was a teenager on holiday, was baste myself in ombre solaire and then lie out in the Spanish sun for you know six hours a day working my way down the suntan lotion line. That's a bad idea because you're just getting a whole load of UV and you've got lotion on, but you're still going to get exposed. That's a, that's a bad thing to do. So we need to get the sun when we can, um, but safely. And then we need to recognize that in the winter, you will become deficient in the UK, certainly. Yeah. And uh, you're in Holland, aren't you, I think? Yes, exactly. I mean, it's the same uh, level. So I think it's exactly the same. Yeah, so it would be the same, yeah. And, and like you say, I mean, People are also in the summer, they're, they're quite often they're just inside or they're in the shade. Yes. So they're hiding from the sun. Yeah. But yeah. Um, our lives have just shifted from like what I've read and, and there's some really interesting, interesting stuff on it, you know, from being hunter gatherers to being nomadic. Mm. You've been with the animals until maybe mm. just before the Industrial Revolution. You've mm. been outside taking care of the animals. So even in the winter or before the summer, after the summer, you were outside. Whereas, mm. whereas now there's just nothing of that anymore. And, mm. uh, and, and uh, it's been, become so convenient just to be inside. You have to really make the effort to get outside. And so yes. I think that's why there's this almost epidemic of, uh, don't want to use the word pandemic, <laughs> epidemic of, of vitamin D deficiency just everywhere. And then, yeah. then we, we, we look at, Okay, so, you know, in, in the Netherlands, we work on the scale of 50 to 200 millimolar per liter mm. vitamin D, according to your GP. Yeah. Uh, so at 50, you'll be, you'll be okay, you know. Yeah, uh, adequate. Adequate, yeah, according to the, the GP. So, but I, I will get people and when I get them to supplement, we usually start first with a test. We either do a, mm -hmm. a, a test we get through the post, you know, two drops of blood, mm -hmm. send it away. Yeah. or they go to the GP. Um, and then we start supplementing with a boost for a month. And then after a month, we test again. As, yeah. as, as a lot of people are, you know, they are, some will take it up very well and others will have uh, a much slower uptake. And uh, then the reaction quite often is, oh, I've got a lot more energy or, mm. or I sleep a lot better. Yes. Or, I feel, or I feel a lot better. Yes, definitely. And so then, you know, what I tend to do is try to get them up to 115, 125, even yeah. 150, you know? Yeah, it's perfect. But so, yeah, what, what is your view on that? How, uh, what, in a nutshell, what's your... Yeah, I think it's spot on. Yeah, it's great. So, again, we have some research from, so your skin will make vitamin D. And just to give, this is, um, with, with the supplements in Holland, what, uh, do you know, are they working in international units or micrograms so when they buy? There's, there's a slow shift to micrograms from international yeah. units. Okay, so same here. Yeah. yeah. So I'll, I'll do both. But um, so uh, in half an hour of strong sun, 
your skin can make 10 to 20,000 units of vitamin D. So that's about, I think, 250 to 500 micrograms in half an hour. So it's a lot, of, a lot of vitamin D. So in the UK, the recommended daily allowance is 200 units. So you can make 10, 20,000, but the, they think you 200 is enough. And the most common tablets will have 400. Yes. So, and the NHS gives 400. So this is not really a physiologically meaningful dose. Well, if you're deficient, well put. that won't get you out of deficiency. But obviously, if you're not testing, you won't know that. No. And therein lies the problem. So um, when we're dosing, we want to consider the amount we can make it our own ourselves. And the other thing we'll recommend, remember, is that when your skin has made enough, your body, your, your body will turn the production off. So you can't become toxic through sun exposure. Yes. Your body will just turn the production down. It's all good. So then the question would be, how, how do we know where's optimal? We don't want to be just, you know, not deficient or adequate at 51. Um, so we would take a lot of people that work in the sun in a, in, a, in a country where it's hot all year round and they are outdoors all year round. So, for example, lifeguards, mm. say in Israel or uh, people that were in Costa Rica in uh, her farmers and so on, lots of these people. And then you look at their, uh, or, or Maasai warriors, for example, um, you look at their blood levels and they're usually in the hundreds, hmm. maybe the low hundreds, maybe the high hundreds, depending on the person. So that means that endogenously what we can make and when your body has had enough, you know, is optimal level, we would say somewhere in the hundreds. And then we'd also look at the um, things like, associations between cancer levels and MS and infections and all stuff and then look at people's blood levels and just see what happens and we're doing that with COVID a lot at the moment we're noticing that there's a trend that the high of vitamin D is generally the worst the severity of you know COVID and there's a reduction in cancers and MS and they, that effect really seems to kick in in the hundreds okay so we want to mimic that I think what you're doing is spot on. And so in the hundreds, you mean when you talk about these people in, in South America or maybe the Maasai warriors, mm -hmm. uh, hundreds more than 200? Are we going to three, four, five hundreds or? Uh, no, no. So they're, they're, they're staying in the hundreds, yeah. yeah oh, they're usually sort of low hundreds to mid hundreds for the most part. Okay, no. So they never go above. You won't get natural production above 200. That wouldn't generally happen. They do do that in some research for things like MS. There's some very... They do very aggressive dosing, like 50,000 units a day, okay. way above what you could make. Yeah. And they have some good effect. And there are some genetics involved a little bit. The, you know, vitamin D, vitamin D is very unusual in that every single cell in the whole body um, has a receptor to receive vitamin D. I think yeah. the only other molecule that does that is thyroid. It's very unusual in that respect. Um, so it's a very powerful thing. And I think what you said there about the energy, that's really common. And, the reason people perform more energy, the reason they sleep better, and the reason it improves their mood, it's very common as well, is because it brings inflammation down. And if you have inflammation up, you're tired, you hurt, yeah. and you're depressed. It's like a triad. Pain, brain, fatigue come up again and again. And, you know, in our, in our practice, people have back pain and they're tired and they're depressed. It's very easy to think that that's – they put them in the biopsychosocial model yeah. and say, ah, it's, you're depressed because you're tired, you're in pain, you're in pain because you're depressed and blah, blah, blah. But actually, there's a root cause often. And if you can remove that root, they will perk right up. And then all of a sudden, our chiropractic work works like it ought to. Great, great. Well explained. Yes. And um, yeah, with the vitamin D, like you said, every cell in the body has a vitamin D receptor. And I saw some research on, uh, was with rats, looking at the uh, the, the IVDs, intervertebral discs, mm. that... It is actually influenced influenced by your vitamin D level. True. And so those are just preliminary. Um, you know, hopefully they can do something later with people where they look at what that does for your uh, for your discs. Yeah. Um, but that already says a lot that every cell has a vitamin D receptor, and I believe the eyes and ovaries have multiple thousands. Wow. And so um, with fertility, if you if you're very low in vitamin D with females, you know that's a big factor. Mm. I think again, like we said, it's evolution. If you're against your natural lifestyle that you evolve with, like you know, the, the the theory is this is a theory, but it would make sense if um, when we migrated from Africa and we went north over millions of years, um, there was natural selection that those with as you go north and you get less sun, there is a natural selection pressure that if your skin is darker and you go north, that the 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 mother who's vitamin D deficient 
um, the when you're so when you're a child, sorry, in your division, you 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 get low level rickets, and your pelvis is often not an ideal shape. So when you then deliver a baby, they'll often die in birth, and the baby will die. Okay. So as you go further north, there's an advantage of having a slightly l- lighter skin tone, and over a period of time. That's why if you're originally from North Finland or Norway or something, you are going to be very, very fair, genetically speaking. And there must be a reason for that. And the theory would be that selective evolutionary pressure, lightening the skin tone, it, because without it, you, you cannot survive. And that's why, again, there's a history of um, things like fermented cod liver oil. Yeah. Tribal people have noticed that certain foods keep them healthy and vital in the longer term. So eating organs, for example, is generally yeah. widely practiced by all tribes people. Uh, so if there's an animal available, they eat it. Yeah. And they eat the organs first. They just do. So uh, yes, they knew that they don't have it, but it is what it is. So um, I know that's where one thing with being a vegan, I've no problem with it as long as you're healthy. I'm good with it. Um, but again, I just from an evolutionary point of view, where animals are available, they are eaten and they are prized for their nutritional content. Always, uh, absolutely. And I, I think you know, I just want to add to what you're saying there because I'm glad you mentioned that, and that's also my approach when it comes to nutrition. And uh, you know, um, I my main focus is working on basic nutrition and so Mm. uh you know i mean i think you go a little bit further there in the detail and and that's great i focus just on making sure people are getting the the the, the nutrients in so Mm. my main focus is just to reduce inflammation and increase nutrient intake and from a dietary perspective the approach that i follow is mainly increase vegetables a lot Mm -hmm. increase uh meat fish and and uh and 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 chicken so to make sure that they get the the good fats but also the protein that they need because what you see with a lot of people is especially when it comes to um uh, chronic fatigue or uh, just not having energy is that they really have a lack of basic nutrition and uh, if you if you focus on that you make that better you you already see that people just get uh, sometimes a lot better yeah, and and I think it's surprising to some people, isn't it? The just the basic stuff you have to have good stuff, and you need to have less bad stuff. And if you do that, your body generally works better. It works better. It, everything works better. And uh, th- that started for myself as well, also many years ago. And I just I just can't veer off. Whatever I do, I just keep coming back as my main thing is my nutrition. And when that works well. I can train, I can, I feel good, I can work and it just mm. all streamlines. Yeah. I think one tricky bit I find with patients is that uh, they, and I tell them this, I have to say to them, you know, the challenge is you don't know what normal is. Yes. Because you've ticked every, you t- you come in with back pain, for example, but you've also ticked headaches and migraine and IBS and depression and anxiety and eczema and asthma. So I know and I've seen your diet, there's no nutrients in it. It's just junk food and sugar and refined flour yeah. <laughs> and some other stuff. Um, with or without animals, you know, that, that's irrelevant. It, vegan junk food is still junk food, right? Uh, meaty junk food is junk, it's just junk food is processed. Yeah. And so they don't know what not, they don't know that they're not meant to have all these things, that they're not all connected with a loss of good nutrients, as you rightly say, and too much inflammation. And until they got on the other side, they don't know what the hell is going on. And that's where it's a leap of faith for them to come with you to take, you know, to change their diet, to maybe take some supplements and maybe remove some gluten and dairy from their diet and see if they're having a reaction. Then on the other side, they're like, wow, I didn't know it wasn't normal to have insert symptoms they didn't even tell you about. And then, like you said, they feel better, they move better, they, they, they get that positive, I think, breaking the vicious cycle. I find people who have pain, pain, brain and fatigue. If you can break that... Because if they're tired and they hurt, uh, they don't want to move. And so they, they lay around, they get deconditioned, they get bigger, they comfort eat, yeah. they're tired, so they eat more sugary food, and they just spiral down into just a terrible uh, condition. And if we can break that at some point and get them out and positive, and you know, they, they become educated and take it on themselves, then all of a sudden, you know, it's, they're with the teamwork then, and not just you dragging them you know, yes. along. Yes, yes, yes. I think that that's where the... The art lies is to explain things where you get them on board, and I mean, mm. you know, you know that process. I think you know it quite well. You you just see when somebody steps onto the boat, 
and uh, mm. and then we can we can work and we can do it and that also means that they're fully behind what we're attempting here it just makes it a lot mm. more powerful especially for their their recovery and healing process yeah i am um, definitely i uh yeah i i think a while ago i read one of your newsletters and uh um you spoke about paul saladino and you, mm -hmm. you read his book i mean i haven't read his book it's still on my list but i i've listened to him quite a lot and I, I find it all very interesting the carnivore diet and yeah. do you have a specific opinion on what you read especially if you think of the uh, the carnivore diet and its effectiveness um and it's pretty extreme i think my it, uh, general's point of view is that the iller the patient is the more extreme the dietary change will need to be mm. And that might be the carnivore diet, which for those people that don't know, it is just eating, not just, it's mainly animal-based products. So you eat offal and you eat meat. You might eat some eggs. There'll be a lot of fat. Often it's ketogenic. He also does, you know, some berries, maybe some honey as well. There's a very, very, um, it, in essence, it's really an extreme elimination diet with a lot of nutrients. Yeah. That's really what it is. And that's exactly what you said, high nutrient. That's the, the cornerstone of the diet bit the course I teach is high nutrient density with, with a high tolerance to the food they come in. All food has baggage, basically. And meat is useful in the sense that um, ruminants are grass-eating grass animals, yeah. eat grass. They then chemically transform the nutrients and the vitamins in themselves. So the plant form of uh, vitamin B6 is inactive, it doesn't do anything. And in fact, in plant, it's bound to another molecule. So they eat it, they then take that molecule off and they get, and then they convert it into the active form that does something. So when you eat an animal, you're basically eating concentrated nutrients. They've done all the chemical conversions, they put it in their tissues and you then eat, and you get the benefit of the activated form in a very easy to get and it's high nutrient density. That's the benefit of eating animals really. And if you tolerate um, you know that then you're fine that's the difficulty in eating if you just plants for some people genetically there's some issues here as well mm -hmm. is that the, the nutrients there's less nutrients relatively and they're in different forms and often they're inactive so this is a subtle nuance there so I don't really recommend a named diet per se I think because I think very much like you, I want my patient's diet to be sustainable there's enough fat yes. diets out there that you can jump on <laughs> the question is how are you going to maintain it? So it's kind of what I generally recommend as sort of a modified sort of Mediterranean paleo style. So yep. we emphasize, I would like them to eat organ meat if they will. I appreciate it. I yes. want to do that. I guess. Yes, yes. Same uh, here. From a nutrient point of view, there is nothing on the planet that comes even close to liver or kidney or, you know, it's just, it's unbelievable. Yep. And then they'll have, you know, and I try and get them to eat quality of meat, not just quantity. So uh, maybe some of the paleo community fall into the trap of e eating meat, you know, like every day, two, three times a day or something, because, you know, hunter gatherer ate meat, so that's fine, but he wouldn't eat it every day. Yeah. And we want to make sure, I'd rather they ate red meat two, three times a week, or maybe, maybe more, a bit less, but did grass-fed organic meat. There's really good quality. Yeah. I uh, mix it with some eggs and some white fish and a little bit of oily fish, lots of vegetables in a Mediterranean style, um, some vegetarian days, did a little bit of fasting. I'm a big fan of intermittent fasting. Great. I do 16-8 um, fasting Monday to Friday. Um, I find that works really well for me as a lifestyle thing as well in the morning. So for si those 16-8 you know, is you have 24 hours in a day, you have an eight-hour feeding window. So for me, I, I eat my first meal around 12, 1 o'clock. Okay. I have all my my food and calories in that eight-ish hour window. I'm not militant about it. Let's say I finish at, say, eight in the evening. I go to bed without having eaten again. I get up and I just don't eat breakfast. And that makes my morning routine easier, my life less stressful. Yeah. And actually it keeps me lean and I feel really good in the mornings. And then I break my fast about 12. I find that's a great way for people to maintain health. And also particularly because the breakfast is the one they typically have a lot of carbohydrate and sugar and yes. a processed variety. Yes. So it removes the trickiest meal of the day to eat sort of, you know, fat and protein yeah. really. Yes. Oh, great. Um, yeah, what I, my wife had, uh, she still has a um, uh, gastritis. So she had a, a stomach ulcer, very bad when I got to know her. And uh, the only thing that seems to work for her, it's it's more than 90% better now. She almost has no more mm -hmm. issues with it. But she has to eat specific times and she mm -hmm. has to eat 
very nutrient dense. So she eats meat three times a day, for example. So she'll mm -hmm. have uh, uh, different types of meat three times a day with purely vegetable and, and mm -hmm. a great deal of fat. And mm -hmm. then the gastritis is really kept aside. She has almost no uh, no issues from it anymore. But it's, mm. you know, like in many situations where you have uh, something like gastritis, it's often it's multifactorial. So you have, uh, like in her case, you know, if she has stress or she has a deadline, she has to work hard, she become more sensitive to it. Mm. And um, she's she's doing a PhD at the moment. She's almost finished. But so there's, there's some pressure. And so, mm. but through her diet, she's managed to really you know keep keep really keep it at bay having no problems with it at all uh the only the only and i we don't see it as a problem but the only thing that you have to then pay attention to is planning Make, yes. making sure that uh that you are we have to go somewhere we we're prepared for that or you know uh, and she fasting is not an option for her whereas for mm. me it, similar to what you're doing sometimes i'll skip breakfast i'll mm -hmm. have a lunch and i'll have a dinner well, sometimes I'll have breakfast and I'll, if I work a little bit longer uh, until yeah. mid-afternoon, then I'll only have dinner. I'll skip lunch. Yeah. And I, and I get my intermittent. Uh, every now and then I'll skip a whole day. Yeah. Nice. Yes. And uh, and I'll just drink some salt water to make sure I get some, um, mm. some, uh, some salt in my body. I think the important point you brought up there is that you, because you are a healthy, healthy guy, you have metabolic flexibility exactly so you can do that without it's not a big deal so if you have to eat breakfast and then a snack at 10 and then lunch and then a snack at four or you fall apart at the seams you have a problem with your blood sugar balance and i definitely used to have that big time mm -hmm. and you're on this roller coaster up and down up and down up and down that's not what we want and like we just you mentioned about paul saladino and the uh, the carnivore diet and this diet and that diet I think that's a really important point in terms of, you know, you want, for me anyway, for, for most people, this is, and so the, the earlier they are, the more extreme the diet has to become. But for most people, there's a midpoint where you want your diet to support your lifestyle, not the diet to become your lifestyle. Mm. If you have to make a diet to become your lifestyle to get better, then that's fine, as your wife slightly has there. Yeah. But for the most part, you want it to be, a way to get energy to go off and do the stuff you want to do and yes. see your friends and have where to work. Not, I can only eat, I don't know, raw vegetables or something, or I only eat liver, you know, raw. Then that becomes a social problem. And, you know, when you travel, yes. it just becomes stressful and big people become a little bit, you know, too focused, mate. <laughs> yes. yes, yes. And and I have to, uh, you know, I'm quite passionate about what I eat and about uh, what's good for you and what's not good for you. And, and that's the thing. Sometimes you have to be a little bit careful. I have to judge who I'm dealing with very well, you know, because a lot of people come from a point where there's so much they can improve. But if, if you only get them to take a couple of steps forward, first of all, you want them to notice that it actually makes a difference. And then they give you the room to improve a little bit more. But maybe that's enough and that's what they're willing to do. And that's great. Yeah, um, yeah great. Now, well said there about the metabolic, metabol being metabolically flexible. Because that's, and I hope uh, people listening to this understood that, because that's, I think, probably one of the biggest problems we struggle with today is the idea that, you know, oh, yeah, well, I'm having a snack halfway through the morning. I'm having a snack halfway through the afternoon. And that's that's just the, what, you know, that's maybe what the, uh, we call it the footing syndrome. Uh, that's what the government advise you, mm. you know, have, have fruit twice a day. And, and people think it's normal that I'm, feeling like I have to have a snack halfway through the morning and halfway through the afternoon. But in actual fact, we should be able to have breakfast, skip a lunch, have dinner, mm. and not really feel hungry. Mm. And then we have that, we're metabolically flexible, where we can go the whole day without uh, struggling or feeling like I can eat my arm off uh, mm. because I have to, and, and just function normal. Yeah. That's great. So I, I have a question to ask about Holland there, because I had a, a patient who was a, a pilot from Holland, and he had, I think he used to have bread or toast, and then he put sprinkles on it. 
in the morning. And this is a Dutch thing. I'm led to. Is this is this a thing in Holland? What's going on? This is a this is a big deal um, over here. I because I'm South African. I live here for ten years now, uh, but I can still not call myself Dutch. If you know what I mean. So this is an incredibly Dutch thing to do. It's called Hagelslag. And uh, it's it's these sprinkles, usually different colors, but uh, depending if it's chocolate or or white or strawberry, don't think you can really taste the difference. But they they will take bread because in the Netherlands they um, maybe you didn't know this, but we eat more grain because of bread in the Netherlands than any other European country. I didn't know that. Yes, that's that's very interesting. That's because there's a lot of a lot of people will have bread for breakfast and lunch. Mm. Standard. So a lot of bread for breakfast, a lot of bread for lunch. And then they'll put either butter or margarine and they'll sprinkle this hagelslag, these, um, it's basically just sugar, over the bread. Mm-hmm. And that's what they have for breakfast. And uh, I've never had it myself. I've seen people eat it, but... Yes, so the the very first thing I tried to do when I asked them about their diet is to get them off that. You know, let's do that only on the weekend, or you know, that's not really that's not really food. <laughs> but I guess the bread that you have there, it probably is a more traditional bread than we would have in England. We have very soft, uh, spongy kind of. It's not really bread bread. It's kind of a highly highly processed. Is is it different over there? Yes and no. I think generally it's the same as in England. As I, 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 you know, I studied in England. I lived there. I know what you're talking about. But if you really go out of your way, um, you will find good bread. But mm. I think the mainstream uh, bread that's being eaten is exactly that soft bread that just never gets old and uh, doesn't get moldy. And yeah, so I don't think it's best. And I, I try to explain to people, you know, having a swollen belly after a meal every time you eat is not a good thing. So the, one of the first steps is, is to get them off the, get them off that amount of grain. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah. I just, it's amazing that I guess I'm surprised they're not fatter in, in Holland. It's amazing. It's all the, is it the, the genetics? Cause you're very tall. I, I felt positively average height when I came to Holland uh, for a visit once. That, I, that could be a reason. The fact that people are it's the tallest nation on the planet. So, um, and yes, I think they move a lot. I mean, a lot of them, you know, they go to places by bicycle, whereas in South Africa, you'd, yeah. if, it, if you have to go around the block, you'll take the car. And, yeah. uh, and here a lot of people, you know, it, it could be a, a businessman or I don't know, anybody with status who generally go with a car, they all like to take their bicycle or at least they have one. That's it. Nice. That, that, it's a very good thing. And I know what you mean. In England, people are um, a little bit more set. They're a little bit bigger in general. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think if nothing else, that has genuinely, uh, with COVID thing, oh, yeah. that's probably more recognized now that this is a, this is a big deal. The, the, the obesity and the risk of you know, ending up in, in ICU and dying if you're a properly obese, it's way, way higher. Um, and unfortunately, over since uh, we had lockdown sort of April, March last year, the average person, I think, has put on a stone and a half, maybe one to two stones is not uncommon now. Oh, what, put on one to two stones, kilo, how many kilograms is that? Oh, uh, what is that? Maybe two or three kilograms? I'm not hundred percent sure. It's enough, like you would notice. Okay. And that's a lack, combination of lack of movement and a lot of alcohol. Wait, how many stone are you? I Roughly. am about so, uh, 11 and a half, 12, about 75 kilograms, I think that 75 is. 75 kilograms, 11. Okay, so that's roughly, um, it's like five or six kilograms per stone. No, more, seven. Uh, yeah, maybe. Uh, it's going to be about five and a half to six kilograms per stone. Yeah. <laughs> you would notice that your clothes that, are going to be tight. That's, that's a lot of kilograms. In, yeah. Yes, absolutely. You know, I've, we've seen it here. It's, people are talking about it. People gained a lot of weight just because of not moving enough because of the COVID yeah. situation. And, yeah. and what goes through my mind is, you know, if you think of the tipping point, the prone, pro-inflammatory cytokines and the anti-inflammatory cytokines, you know, and you think of the cytokine storm, 
where's the tipping mm. where's the tipping point for people who's now gained enough weight so they become vulnerable mm. to the covid virus as that's yep. as obesity is the biggest reason or the biggest uh, underlying factor no doubt no and, doubt at all and the same with the, with diabetes they're often obese obviously but diabetes is a very very pro inflammatory state um same thing and one of the uh, tragedies is at the, near the beginning of the the lockdown in the uk there's a cardiologist called Asim Maltora, who is brilliant. And he said, you know, you can reverse diabetes in three months. If you do a hardcore, you're no longer diabetic. We have an opportunity here. This is before anything about vaccines or anything. It was in April, I think it was. Yeah. That by the end of the summer, we could have the nation in a really good place if we go for it. That will bring down the number of people dying and in ICU massively. Yeah. Um, didn't happen, obviously. <laughs> <but there we> <laughs> I was just thinking, oh, so what was the outcome of that? Uh... Yeah, not so much. We, we, we got fatter. It was the opposite. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I saw something about Boris Johnson saying something about move more, or, you know, and uh, whether you like him or not, I mean, nowhere else did a leader leader speak of moving more or taking better care of your health. And that's that's what I... Well, that's partly, he was very poorly in, in intensive care. Oh. So, and he put on a lot of weight and he was the first to say, I got a bit fat and he used to cycle everywhere yeah. when he was a mayor of London and this, he would do lots of cycling and he just got bigger and bigger. Okay. So I think, um, he recognized his own role in that, but obviously from a, a media point of view, a politician saying, he's not saying this, but the media would interpret him saying, you don't need to lose weight. That's kind of. And at fat shaming and saying it's your fault that you've got COVID. He's not saying that, obviously. <laughs> but the media, I mean, if you're very careful in what you say, yeah. uh, you're going to get yourself in trouble. Yes, because I, I'm just so surprised that there was nothing mentioned about vitamin D. You know, increase vitamin D, do things to to make yourself more resilient to this virus. Mm. And and nowhere, I asked somebody uh, that I know who's high up in the organization that dealt with how to to take on this situation and mm. um i asked him about vitamin d and he just told me straight he said no there's no way that the government would give any advice in uh, on taking more vitamin d or increase your vitamin d level levels because it's a fat soluble vitamin and it, it can build up and it beca can become mm. toxic yeah and and i was thinking to myself well uh, you know to right but at the same time, I think something, I, I, I don't know the numbers, but 60 or 70% of the country is deficient in vitamin D. So, yeah. so at the same time, you know, if you have a national approach to uh, getting everybody's vitamin D level up to, well, get it higher, you can say, okay, go to your GP. You know, I mean, obviously people aren't paying for that. Get it tested mm -hmm. and we do this properly. So we can try to avoid any complications. Mm. Well, in the UK, it has been mentioned, it was mentioned earlier, on that vitamin D is very important for your immune system. We have some good research to back up. There is some research say that you get less infections, respiratory infections with the higher levels of vitamin D and interventional stuff. And then very quickly, they were saying the people that are getting really ill seem to be very low. Now, you know, we don't have to 100% know whether that is association or causation, right? But there is now a lot of research to back up the fact that if you're low in it, you are going to have a harder time. And if you give them a mega dose at the beginning and then straight at various points end their recovery, they are far less likely to die, like 60 percent in a recent study. Yeah. Now, so that we, we it is being mentioned in the media here a lot. And there's been a bit there was a, a lot of research has put together a paper and, and it's, it's kind of a open letter to the, with the world basically saying, come on. And I think. One of the issues the government had, I, I, um, NICE from the UK did a review, the government body, and they seemed quite at pains to say, this is not a cure for COVID. And I think I understand what they're saying, but it, it's a, a more nuanced conversation than that. Yeah. We're not trying to find a cure. We're saying, well, listen, we know that in the middle of winter, 87% of the UK are either deficient or insufficient. That's a real epidemic, right? And we have good evidence to say that also, I also say that people that are dying the most in England are elderly, obese people and black and Asian groups. They're all 100 percent 
deficient or insufficient because yep. of the skin tone, because obese people are lower and when you're elderly, you make less. So when we know who's dying and we know they're all deficient and it's a, a hormone, really, vitamin is a hormone, we know they should have good levels of yeah. it. Why would you, if you haven't got perfect research, why would you leave them deficient? For me, this is because it's not a drug. And this is where I think the regulators and the governments get their knickers in a twist. They're treating vitamin D, which is a naturally produced hormone, yeah. like a drug. Drugs are inherently have a danger. If you get it wrong, you can really hurt people. I understand that you need to be careful. Yeah. It isn't a drug. It's overwhelmingly safe. It is dirt cheap. Yeah. And we know the people that are dying are low in it. So without perfect reason, I would just say, just give everyone a good dose. And this goes back to the point made earlier. Our government did actually say we'd recommend everyone take 400 units. But that isn't enough. If you're obese or elderly or dark skin, you need really probably 4,000 would be a good level for most people to start at. Then we mm. might see something happen. And I don't see any downsides. They're not saying, hey, it's a cure. Yeah. We can say you're deficient. We can say we can bring it up. And there's a good body of evidence to say that it's good for infections. And there's some uh, research say that it might help with COVID. We can't be sure, but there's no downside. So let's just go ahead and do it. I have no idea why you wouldn't do that. It just blows my mind. And I feel uncomfortable ethically that they haven't done it. Yeah. There's just such a strong correlation between the groups that you mentioned, who's low and who's also suffering from the COVID. It's just such yeah. a strong correlation. And I remember myself, even when I was living in England, being a student, I I mean, you know, I, I tried to take care of my health, but as a student, I mean, you get a lot wrong. And I definitely mm. didn't look at my vitamin D levels. And I came from South Africa, always feeling on top of the world, you know. And the winters and not getting sun and being inside, I mean, it, it, I can, I, I, with a lot of certainty, I can say that it, it must have been a big reason why I had can almost call it depression where i was feeling really mm. really low for weeks on yeah. end and mm. since we've since i've been busy with this and also my wife um you know i mean i go through the winters just feeling strong and feeling good uh, yeah. and of course when you get ill you're gonna you take a little dip but it's 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 not a mental low that i used to have constantly mm. and and then in, in the netherlands the the gps are I've had a lot because I, I test a lot of my patients. I get get them tested for vitamin D, um, uh, kind of standard. And every now and then it will leak out to the to the doctor of the patient of mine what mm -hmm. I'm doing, or you know they'll check with the doctor because they've been at the doctor say, well, Jacob, the chiropractor wants them to do this, you know. And then I'll mm -hmm. I'll get I'll get a very upset patient back where the doctors told them that um, this is absurd you know it's, it's crazy uh, you can never take those doses and then i'll do the same thing as what you explained earlier i mean if you in the sun for an hour fully exposed if you would be two hours in the sun completely naked in the middle of the summer if your skin is able to handle that you'll make between 20 and forty thousand ius and uh and they'll be like oh really it's okay is that possible i'm saying yeah well compared to the 200 or 400 international units that you're being advised from the doctor when you've had maybe a, a, a 20 or even lower out of 200, a very low level. And then I explained yeah. to them that, you know, that's not going to do the, the trick. It's, you, it's, it's, it doesn't work. So, and then they, they get back on track and they like, they're, they're open for advice and they're like, okay, you know, let's do this. But um, it, it really is being treated in the Netherlands by the medical profession, like a, like a drug like something mm. that's incredibly uh, um, dangerous. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's almost sometimes I have to like rethink, am I, am I still, you know, have I got it right? Uh, mm -hmm. Because you've got such an opposing view over there on how to approach this. And um, uh, I'm just wondering, do you use vitamin K2 with the vitamin D? What's your opinion on that? I Generally, yes, we'll, we'll we, uh, give out, yeah, it's a, a combined formula. So it'll be vitamin D with some K2 in there. Yeah. Um, you, don't, you, don't, you know, it's hard to know that we haven't really got a proper reliable test for K2. Um, 
you can get K2 from eating, so your dark leafy greens like kale have lots of vitamin K1 in it, and you can convert some K1 into K2. And if you have a good microbiome, lots of good bugs, they will produce some uh, K2 for you as well. And if you're eating dairy, if you tolerate dairy fine, and if the animals are grass-fed, so you get good quality grass-fed butter, they'll have some K2 in it as well. So I don't know that everybody definitely needs it, but the potential downside, in the, it's a longer term issue, might be that if you're absorbing calcium maximally, the vitamin K, it basically turns uh, the protein in your bones on and it sucks calcium into the bone. So it's very good for bone density in the longer term. So the danger might be you're absorbing lots of calcium by having the vitamin D, but without the, if you're low in vitamin K2 for whatever reason, the calcium won't go into the bones and it can then potentially end up in the arteries and there's some inverse relationship between osteoporosis and heart disease so you have to be a little bit careful moving the longer term with that yeah very good great and um i'm just wondering do you want to say something about the uh, academy for chiropractic nutrition i mean that's your yeah your thing so it's for uh, practitioners yeah so if you're a chiropractor or an osteopath physio uh, then it's, the, it's called the Academy of Chiropractic Nutrition.com, but it obviously it's we have lots of osteopaths on board and physios just because I'm a chiropractor and that's kind of started it for chiropractors. So it's um, it's kind of my journey where I, I did lots of functional medicine and nutrition, but at a full on end, it's very difficult to take that information and, and put it into a, a, a neuromechanical chiro situation. It's not, it's quite hard to integrate it. So I kind of synthesized it down and made it a bit more applicable and i think the key thing kind of we talked about vitamin d and diet is that there is sort of an 80 20 thing there are certain things that are we would call them keystones okay. or bottlenecks to change so something that will hold the system together and vitamin d is a great example if you're low in vitamin d really low like under 25 or something it doesn't matter what else you do you will not get better it is so profound because of the inflammation and the pain, all that stuff it does, and it's such a mismatch of evolution. You could give them a perfect diet and other sort of things, it will, they will just will not get better. So it's a bottleneck to change. So if we can get hold of those bottlenecks, like vitamin D is one, B12 will be another one, yeah. magnesium, and other things, and the diet stuff we talked about, if you can get hold of those, and I'm going to put that into a sort of a, 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 um, a phased approach for the, for the practitioners, and did... Um, then uh, it, it, you get great results with your chiropractic and then you get a lot of accessory benefits for the patient. They, you know, they feel a lot better um, as well. So that's for practitioners. Um, they can just academyofchiropractic.com and there's uh, the course. Um, is sort of, I, I offer the course up on and off and then there's the newsletter which comes out uh, Fridays at five with sort of, you know, nutritional tidbits, uh, thoughts, you know, ideas, research, reviews, that kind of stuff. I enjoy those. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. And Ben as well in his uh, non-presence. So, um, yeah, that's great. I think uh, we'll stop here, Simon. It's been great talking to you. I, I think that there's there's a lot of uh, things we do quite similar. And, uh, you know, it's always, it's always great to hear someone who, who kind of looks at certain things in the same way to to hear how they how they do things because there's those little differences that you're like aha okay yeah that's very interesting oh no that's great and um so it's been a real pleasure talking to you and having you on the show and um thank you all the best thanks for having me